Hey everybody, it's Zach with, with uh, Public Proclaimer Ministries. You're in my office with me today. And I've been reading an awesome book by an author named F.B. Meyer. And the book is called Hints for Lay Preachers. It's a book F.B. Meyer wrote on his advice to preachers. And it's not a very long book, maybe 120 to 150 pages. And the pages are not very big. But in this book, it's had me thinking about preaching. And so I wanted to do a video on my personal method, typically, for how I would develop and write out a sermon if I was going to be preaching in a church or whenever God leads me to prepare a sermon. So thank you for joining me today. If you're not subscribed, hit the subscribe button below as I seek to bring you more God-led content to you through this channel. So, of course, a great verse today for this YouTube video, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. And in it, it says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so we want to be students of the word uh, in, in our Bible study. And so uh, I wanted to share with you also a quote from F.B. Meyer on his way of developing a sermon. And then I'm going to share with you how I go about that, which is oddly very similar to F.B. Meyer's ways, according to his own writings in his book uh, here. So F.B. Meyer said on page 70. Uh, let's see here, in 75 of Hints for Lay Preachers, quote, In latter years during my ministry in London, I have not been able to write, but the habits of consecutive thinking and clear expression which were formed at York and Leicester have stood me in good stead. So F.B. Meyer's method in his earliest days of preaching was to write out all of his sermons and memorize them for his preaching, sometimes doing that as many as a few sermons a week, which I think is incredible kind of mind to retain all that. But he said in his latter years, that's not what he is, his methods were. It is now my ideal to select my text fairly early in the week and allow it to lie in my thought. Then on Friday or Saturday, I will give three or four hours to its quiet consideration, jotting down thoughts which occur to me on sheets of note paper and reading whatever materials I may have in my library that will help me towards that end. I greatly enjoy this accumulation of my materials. After a while, the main message of the sermon becomes apparent. One feels that this is the burden of the Lord for the coming service, perhaps. The argument, the illustrations, the application all stand out, and it is comparatively easy in an hour or less to crystallize the whole preparation into the outline of the sermon. I have known cases in which that outline did not appear clearly unto me until within an hour or two of preaching, but when that is the case, it does not greatly concern me. One comes to trust a species of automatic process by which the mind will ultimately evolve the message and its ordering. Often during those hours of preparation, whilst engaged with the accumulation of material or in its orderly arrangement, the heart is lifted up for the enlightenment of God's Spirit on which one may surely count if one has no object other than to be the message bearer of the Lord of hosts. And so that's F.B. Meyer's sharing of how he developed a sermon. And from F.B. Meyer's notes uh, in his book on Hints to Lay Preachers, I wanted to share kind of how I go about developing a sermon, which is very similar to F.B. Meyer's. So number one in developing a sermon from my point of view and, and practice is to select a text fairly early in the week. And this is usually organic. Usually in selecting a text is where you may have been studying at the time. God's providentially had you in a certain place in Scripture, which then applies to where the church is at the time that you're going to be preaching in or to the lives of the congregation or people in front of you. So a lot of times we think we're selecting the text and God has been preparing you to select a certain text as timing and his guidance and everybody's lives together have cascaded into this moment when you're going to be preaching to them that that text becomes apparent and clear. And in selecting a text fairly early in the week, you need to be open to any and all texts of Scripture as to God's guiding you to that for that opportunity to preach. I know a lot of people, it seems like nowadays, really try to shy away from harder texts like when Jesus rebuked the Pharisees or when the Bible talks about hell or like Jesus' rebuke in Mark 9, 43 to 47 when he talks about plucking out the eye or cutting off the hand if it causes you to sin. But in choosing to not preach from certain scriptures 
pre any guiding of God, you're putting yourself in the driver's seat and you're already setting yourself up to not be hitting the mark for where God would have you that Wednesday night or that Sunday morning or that Sunday night or that Thursday or when you're preaching that revival. Whatever opportunities that you find yourself in, you must, number one, have an attitude of openness to God's guiding you to whatever scripture he would put on your heart to preach, no matter how hard or how soft you, you, you believe that scripture to be for your crowd in front of you. So number one in developing a sermon is to select the text fairly early in the week. And this, again, is organic. It may happen even up to the hour or the minute before you go to preach, but God will guide you in, in standard practice apart from God doing anything unique in you, is to select a text fairly early in the week, number one. Number two, muse over the text. So uh, some people's practice in, in their nervousness to preach or in their uh, agitation to get behind the pulpit, they are very anxious and uh, they are obsessive and compulsive in writing down every thought they can possibly think of. They're anxiety ridden as they prepare for their Sunday morning sermon or Sunday night or Wednesday night. They, and there's nothing wrong with being serious about the task at hand. For every idle word we speak, the scripture says, will be brought to judgment for. So we want to be serious about our opportunities to preach God's word and herald it correctly, but muse over it. Once you've got an idea of where God is leading you, let your soul and your mind dwell there for a while. Apply it in your own self. Let the scripture soak in you before you worry about how to dissect it and present it to someone else. So number one, select a text, typically fairly early in the week. Number two is to muse over the text. Typically, that may look like keeping a pen and pad close by, so when God brings certain thoughts to your mind or when certain notes pop out or stand out to, your, to you mentally, you are prepared to note them on a pad. You'll tell yourself now, I'll remember that and write it down when I get home from work or when I get home from running errands, and you will not. So please keep the pen and pad handy. That may also look like uh, taking out your cell phone and jotting down whatever notes that are coming to your mind in your notes tab on your iPhone or whatever type of phone you have to jot down notes on your cell phone. I know that in a, a most recent uh, sermon opportunity that I had to preach that uh, I had a note tab uh, in, with my sermon's title and uh, all of the various uh, points that were coming to my mind, etc., uh, on that note tab. So my sermon outline sort of took took organic shape throughout the week as I mused over the text. So number one, select a text. Number two, muse over that and keep some notepad or cell phone or something handy so you can jot down notes as your mind thinks of them. Number three, on Wednesday or Thursday, typically I begin putting my ideas on paper. So if I'm preaching on Sunday morning or Sunday night or whatever, if it's on a Wednesday night, several days beforehand, I start writing, getting those notes on either my cell phone or a pen pad and paper like this. Uh, I start getting them into physical structure to some extent. Nothing too obsessively, compulsively serious, but I'm getting it structured. Number four, typically reading other materials pertinent to the text. So maybe that may look like a, a, sir, a, a scripture outline or or um, some exegetical work on the text that you're reading, maybe from a, a preacher that you have well respected, like Wesley's notes or, or uh, Jonathan Edwards' notes or so many other ministers from the past, people that you may gain or glean from. Doesn't mean you agree with them on everything, but you're gleaning from them their ideas and how they thought about it as a way of helping you in your own. Now, F.B. Meyer is very serious about not plagiarizing in your sermons. If you do read quote for quote something from a minister, in, big end quote and end quote it so that people know when your thoughts are going and when someone else's thoughts are going. And a good point he made is the Bible says, thou shalt not steal. And so the, the, it's, it's theft to plagiarize and present it as if it were your own original thought. So ideally, F.B. Meyer says when you're reading other scriptures or other Bible books that are helping you present and prepare your sermon, you are taking what some other minister has said, redigest it in a way that you would say and present it in the way you can share that thought with somebody else. That way that it's really you who is constantly being the message bearer and not you 
getting rid of yourself in the light of somebody else from the past. Reading other materials. This may also look like uh, looking at a Strong's Concordance to break down the original languages. I do that very often in my personal Bible study and in preparing a sermon. I often use a Strong's Concordance as the Bible was not written in King James English. The King James Bible was not the first Bible ever written. And I, I read from a King James Bible. I preach from a King James Bible. But I understand that it is not the original the, the prophets and the apostles did not speak King James English. They spoke Hebrew and Greek. And there is a reason you should be a student and open to the idea of learning what the original words may have meant because a lot of times their language was far more robust than ours. We say we love pizza, we love cars, we love our home, we love our wife, uh, we love all these things. We only have love to really express that, but they have phileo and agape and eros and all kinds of ways that their Greek words, which we translate as love in the scriptures through translation purposes, but in the original language, you would not know that if you were not going to be a student by picking up a concordance or going to a website I love to use, blueletterbible.org. And in blueletterbible.org, I often hit the Strong's button, and that helps me to go back to the original languages very quickly and um, study in that manner. So I'll just pull that up really quick. This is kind of what the beginning interface of blueletterbible.org looks like. And when you search a scripture like 2 Timothy... 2 Timothy 2.15, I searched that scripture. Uh, and at the top of the page, you'll see several sections. You can actually hit a button up there called Strong's. I hit the Strong's button, and now every word in that scripture has the Strong's concordance Greek new, uh, number next to it. So if you want to research what a certain word meant in the original language, you can click on the number next to the word and then you can learn about that word from the original language and it's going to help you develop your thoughts. So that's a lot of where I spend my time outside of the Bible is in a Strong's Concordance or reading other preachers' thoughts about certain texts of Scripture. That was number four. Number five, establish the context of my selected passage. So I'm going to read above and below my selected passage. I want to get a good view uh, of where I'm at in the scriptures. What is going on? Why is what I'm preaching about being said or done in the scripture itself so that I'm not stripping Bible passages out of their context to preach something that the Bible never meant to be to be said because that's not what was being talked about in that section of scripture. Now, I'm all about taking the scriptures and applying them to your daily life. There are ministers who maybe even hold to some sort of dispensationalism type of thing where they say everything in the New Old Testament was for just J Israel, so none of it is applicable to my modern day life. And that kind of attitude is very arrogant and foolish as you are shutting yourself off to the Holy Spirit, which inspired the Old and New Testaments for your benefit today, as God is the God who was and is. So God is now, and the God that inspired the Old Testament at the time that it was inspired and, 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 and written and jotted down is the same God of the New Testament, and he can take his whole counsel of Scripture to mold and shape your life. In fact, Jesus said, Look into the Scriptures, for they are they which testify of me, when people challenged who he was. And that was encouraging people under his time to go to the Old Testament scriptures, uh, which we call Old Testament today, to see if the things he was saying were so. So even Jesus encouraged people to have a bold, a broad view of inspiration to scripture and to be impacted by it. So learn the context of your passage. Number six, determine the main point of my message. So by this time, as you've selected a passage a couple days ago or God's putting it on your heart, as you are uh, reading other texts and, and, and things of that and you're musing on it, you're jotting down notes on your pen pad or, or on your cell phone or whatever for preparation purposes and as you're getting your outline kind of in your head taking shape, you're going to understand what the main point of your message is. And the main point should be very obvious to your crowd. You've been also an audience member to someone else preaching, and you know how easy it can be for your mind 
to drift. No matter what someone is presenting, any presentation suffers a great damage if they do not make their main point clear. If it just feels like a bunch of jumbled up statements and none of it really has a main thrust or reason how it all fits back together in the end of your sermon, people feel sort of left in the air and unclear as to what to do or as if there's no action they can put behind it. So it was just a nice thing to sit and listen to for 45 minutes or an hour. So we don't, we're not in the entertainment business. We want people to be actionable with what we say. And so that needs to be understood in your audience from your main point. And that main point should coincide with why God put that certain scripture on your heart. If you want your audience to repent and God has put repentance as the subject of your mind and heart for that specific sermon opportunity, then repentance should be the main thrust of what you are preaching on and saying. It should be the main point of what you're getting at. And I've been accused before of being too repetitive in my sermons, but I would actually rather be more repetitive than not so that my audience knows what I'm trying to say. So please be plain in what your main point is. Number seven, finalize my thoughts on paper. Sometimes I use three to five headings, uh, each of which work toward establishing the main point of my message. Sometimes I have one, sometimes I may not have a main three to five heading points. And I know some people that are almost uh, spiritually religious to the idea of if I preach a sermon, I'm gonna have three main points. And if my main message starts with the letter D, then all three of my main points start with the letter D. And and there's like a, a an odd religious conviction that that's most effective. And if that works for you, who am I to object to that? I'm not trying to, but I'm saying that be committed to what God puts on your heart, whether that's three points, one point, 10 points, 30 points. It doesn't matter the amount of points, just know that the more points you build up, the more you're taking your audience through a journey. And as you're taking your audience through multiple points in this journey, the further you kind of get from the main point if you're not consistently holding them there in each of the sub points and headings that you have. And ultimately at the end of your sermon creation, you are bringing them from the end of that back to the beginning of what your main point was, sort of making a complete circle in the sermon experience for your audience. That way that they feel that they've started a journey, went through a journey, arrived at the end point, and you leave them with something to walk away with, that that can then give them some action. So uh, establish your points and be flexible to the leading of the Holy Spirit would be my final point to give you, is to be flexible. I have had some times when I thought, man, I put a sermon together really well or prepped something, and then in the very end of preparing that, um, within 30 minutes of me uh, getting up to preach or within 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever, I feel like God has really put on my heart that he's changing it. And that's not because I feel like I am smarter and I'm figuring things out. It makes me feel really dumb. Like I'm about to get up and say something that I know nothing about, but God establishes the words in your mouth. If you are a preacher in that moment in time, obedient to his spirit, called of God and prepared, he will give you what it is that you are to say. And that is the uh, superiority of Christianity is that our God is not dead. He is alive and is active in our lives as, as preachers and as Christians. And he will give you what you need when you ask of him. So God will sometimes change things on you depending on the air of the room or of the audience in the, in the, in the open air. And you need to be willing to be changed or on the fly when it comes to that. If God changes your sermon suddenly and what you had prepared and thought you did a good job on is suddenly irrelevant, tuck it in your pocket. God gave you that for a reason and he will have you use it when the time is right. So don't become discouraged. Be teachable and leadable by the Holy Spirit. Final point of this message or this video, what about open air preaching? Do I prepare a sermon when I go to preach in the open air? And the answer is a flat no. I may be going to a beer fest to preach or a gay pride parade to preach or a family festival fun event to preach or maybe just down a sidewalk in downtown uh, where people are walking and going about their day and start preaching. You can 
actually hinder yourself in the open air by getting five main heading points and having to go through those five main points without interruption before you ever interact with your audience. Open air preaching is 100% different. You are looking to interact with the people in front of you. You want the heckler who's going to interrupt you. You want questions from the crowd that engages the minds of your audience and hooks everybody together. When you're preaching on Sunday morning or Wednesday night at your church, people came there intentionally and expect a sermon. When they meet you in the open air and you're preaching, they are not intending or probably even desiring to hear you. So engaging with them will draw their desire and will ultimately be the reason you're there to preach to the people in front of you. You want to interact with them just as much as you want to interact with your congregation at Wednesday or Sunday morning uh, services. So I don't prepare a sermon, but I do stay prepared, and that is a different point. You, you stay constantly prayerful, you stay led of the Holy Spirit in your day-to-day -day life, and when you go into the open air and God prompts your heart, or when you look for that you know, definite, you plan that opportunity, you take that day off of work, or you take that day off that you're off from your, your task, and you go and preach, you are spiritually prepared to be used by God in that moment. I know if I'm going to a particular event, maybe like a beer fest, I may jot down on a pen pad or some notes on certain scriptures that pertain to, uh, you know, alcoholism or drunkenness. Or if I'm at a gay pride parade, I'll jot down some notes on certain scriptures perhaps that helps me to have quick reference. So when I'm preaching, I'm not saying, uh, 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 or I'm not saying, well, I don't, I'm just quoting words, but I'm not giving them the number and verse. It's very important when you're memorizing scripture to give your audience number and verse. I've seen people call me on that by saying, you know, well, where's that at in scripture? And I've shared with them when I haven't known that. But I've uh, said, well, Google search it, and Google will show you really quick. But I think it's more pertinent for the preacher to show himself prepared by having the chapter and verse. That way, when he is preaching scriptures, he can uh, hold his audience to the truth of the Bible by telling them, I am not the author of these statements. These are quoted scriptures. Here's the chapter and verse. Take it up with God. And so that is how I prepare for an open air sermon. I cater my sermon in the open air. To, the time, to what my audience is doing in that moment. If I'm at a certain event that is meant to be promoting sin, it's that particular sin that a lot of my preaching will be about. And repentance is a large part of the open air ministry. We are calling people to repent. We are doing the work of an evangelist. And so repentance uh, with the Holy Spirit, who the Bible says comes to testify of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. I think that's John 16, 8. Uh, what the Holy Spirit comes to testify of in the world. So in keeping with the Holy Spirit, I want to preach on sin, righteousness, and judgment to come from an attitude of God-ledness. I'm not preaching about certain sins to beat people up or to pick on people or to make myself look better than them. That's not the attitude here at all. Uh, it is to cater your message to fit their life so that they can see the Bible applies to them. And then here's what the Bible also says if you're in this sin, or here's what the Bible says about God's judgment, or here's what the Bible says about God's demands for righteousness in us, or how we attain to that righteousness. And so you want to make it applicable, otherwise you're just a clanging sound. You're not uh, impacting people. You're not influencing people. You're not moving anyone. Uh, so we want to be engaging with our audience. So those are seven points on how I develop a sermon for in-house preaching or maybe house church or wherever it is you find yourself in front of a willing congregation. And when you're in front of an unwilling congregation like an open air audience, that's kind of what I do. That's how I stay prepared. That's how I preach in the open air myself. So I'm just sharing with you a little bit about me in that regard. You have your own methods and you are your own you are your own self to God. You are his servant and not mine. So do what God leads you in your own heart, but hopefully some of this would be helpful to you as you hear a little about how God leads me to do how I do. So God bless you. Have a good day. Don't forget to subscribe and enjoy the videos.